Uh, John Picciotti uh, has made an incredible investment in my life. Uh, he texted me a brief word of encouragement earlier this week. Dave, just dropping you a line to let you know that today I'm celebrating my 45th year in Christ. Just wanted to let you know that I have, you have been a significant part of the journey. Love you, brother, Coach Pick. When Pick was 30 years old, he left his real estate practice and joined staff of Young Life. Uh, Young Life is a Christian organization that sends their staff to where kids are uh, to win the right to be heard and to, to win teenagers to the Lord Jesus. Uh, Pick became Coach Pick and poured his life into teenagers. And I was one of those teenagers that he helped to win to Christ. I have known Coach Pick now for over 30 years, and he has been there for me at every key point in my life. A constant source of encouragement. He's now in his 60s uh, and wanted me to pray for him just this week uh, that he would have wisdom on how he and his wife could, could leverage their lives during this season for the gospel of the Lord Jesus. He wants his life to count for Christ. He wants to make a worthy investment like he did it with me all those years ago. He still wants to do it today. I love Coach Pick. I would not be the man I am today if it was not for his investment in my life. His life, his investment forever changed mine. Do you have your own coach pick? Do you have someone who's made a worthy investment in your life? Do you have someone who's always in your corner, always supporting you? Uh, someone who texts you out of the blue and says, you have been a significant part of my journey. I love you. Do you have a coach pick? And are you a coach pick to someone else? Who have you made a worthy investment in for the kingdom of God? Who can you now make a worthy investment in for the kingdom of God? As I spoke to, to pick this past week, I, I heard him speak about his life, and uh, he reminded me of just how short life is. Life is a vapor. We are given so few years, so few days, so few hours to invest in others. I almost could hear the tension in his voice as he is in his 60s and thinking about the end of his professional life, and he still wants to continue to have his life count for the kingdom of God. He wants to make a worthy investment for Christ. So I pray this morning as we approach this text that we would understand the, the brevity of life, and we will all be encouraged to make a worthy investment in the kingdom of God. We're going to do that this morning by asking three questions of our text. The first is, how are you encouraging people? How are you encouraging people? I'm asking that question. I'm praying the Holy Spirit's going to help you uh, to answer it as we walk through our text. Um, those of you who are just kind of joining, we're in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, Apostle Paul is on his third missionary journey. Uh, he was in Ephesus preaching the word of the Lord, and the Lord had gave him great favor, uh, so much so that people's lives were being transformed. Um, the gospel in Ephesus for two years was going forth, causing people to turn away from idols to the one true and living God. So much so that idol makers, Demetrius the silversmith in particular, uh, caused everyone to come together and started this riot against Paul and the apostles. So the, the word of the Lord was moving so mightily that it was causing people's lives to be, to be changed. The culture was being changed and, and shifted. And yet, people tried to oppose the work, yet the Word of God continued to go forth. There will always be things in people that try to discourage or thwart our investment of the kingdom of God, but the kingdom investment will always be worth it. Look at verse 1 of Acts chapter 20. After the uproar ceased, the uproar speaking of that which Demetrius started in Acts chapter 19, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions, he had given them much encouragement. He came to Greece. One of the words that exemplifies the Apostle Paul's ministry is encouragement. And when most of us think of Paul, we think of his letters, we think of his church planning, his, his sermons before council and kings. But most of Paul's ministry was a ministry of encouragement, simple encouragement in the gospel. He would go to cities 
He would preach the gospel. He would gather them together as a congregation. And then he would spend the rest of his life going back and encouraging them to stay true to Christ, to hold fast to Jesus and make his name known to others. So in verse 1, he said he called the disciples, and after encouraging them, he left. In verse 2, he went through all the regions, giving them much encouragement. Then he left. Paul traveled all throughout the known world, leaving breadcrumbs of encouragement everywhere he went. Can the same be said of you? Beloved, I, I pray that we would be a people of encouragement, that we would remind people to have hope in Christ, that we would help people to, to, to suffer uh, the sufferings of this present world. Do not compare to the glories that will be received in glory. Uh, let, us be reminded, let us remind people that what the Father sees, what we do in secret, he will reward us. Let us encourage us to, to tell people that Jesus is worth it. He's worth to risk all for. Uh, let us be people who are encouraged with grace and mercy day after day, again and again. And let us encourage everyone to make much of Jesus Christ and to make him your greatest treasure. This is exactly what Paul did. And this is what we are called to do. So let me just ask us, Park Baptist Church, are we a people of encouragement? Uh, does encouragement ex exemplify our church family? Does it make it into our homes? What about your conversations with your kids? Do people think of you as being critical of others or encouraging and grateful for them? Are we quicker to say, what's wrong with these people? Or, I'm so happy with what God is doing in this person's life. Paul encourage the saints. And I pray that we would just do the same. But notice that Paul didn't just encourage people in general. He invested his life into specific people. All throughout his ministry, we see Paul surrounded by brothers and sisters laboring alongside him, people that he invested his life in. Look at verses 3 and following. This is speaking in Greece. He said, there he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean, son of Byrus, uh, Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Segundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas where he stayed for seven days. Uh, now Luke, the, the author of the book of Acts, is, is, is a historian, and he provides specific details in this travel narrative. Now we may gloss over those details, but these details provide confidence in the historicity, the, the veracity, the truthfulness of the book. It helps legitimize the, the truthfulness of his account. So Paul picks up a handful of characters in his missionary travels. Sopater for us from Berea, the, the, those who closely examined the scriptures. Uh, Aristarchus and Segundus came from Thessalonica. He was there for only three and a half weeks. Uh, Timothy and Gaius were from Derby, and Antiochus and uh, Trophimus uh, were from Asia. So everywhere he went, Paul took people close to him so he could invest in them. Uh, he took these men with him to, to labor and to train them so that he could send them back to their countries. He spent his life encouraging men in the things of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes this. He says, you then, speaking to Timothy, one of the ones just mentioned, he said, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now, Paul probably could have wrote this same exact uh, charge to any one of his companions, but Timothy, being the youngest probably among these men, probably needed the encouragement the most, as often young men do. He says, what you have heard from me, uh, give to others. 
Uh, Paul says this numerous times in his letters, whatever you have heard and seen from me, give away. Paul asked Timothy to give to others what he has first received from him. Uh, Timothy was to look for faithful men who would be able to give themselves to others. Paul modeled what he expected of Timothy. This is an important leadership principle that you can't ask anyone to do what you yourself are not willing to model and show them. Paul invested his life in almost every city and every town he went. He made a worthy investment, and that worthy investment would help the gospel have ripple effects for centuries to come. We have to see that this investment is not easy. For immediately, what did Paul say after he says, invite your life into others? He gives them three analogies. You must be a good soldier, a disciplined athlete, and a hardworking farmer. Every one of those roles will require a lot of effort over a long period of time. Discipleship is not for the faint of heart. It requires patience, discipline, and lots of hard work over a long period of time. It is not quick. It's not instant. It takes time. You know, parents, God is calling you to be the main disciple makers of your children. You need to be like a good soldier of Jesus Christ helping your children not to get entangled with the the affairs of this world. Like a hardworking farmer sowing seeds of grace and mercy into your children's life day after day, and then one day God will reap a harvest in them. Invest your life in your children. Give them Christ every single day. Do not grow weary in encouraging them to look to Christ. Now that is not just for those who are being standing forward today, being dedicated, dedicating their children to the Lord. That is for all parents. You know, one of the greatest travesty of the modern day church is that they've removed discipleship from the home and given it to the church. Listen, the the church will only be as strong as the parents who disciple their children in the home. We must continue to give ourselves to discipling our children. We have the responsibility to invest our life into others. You know, one of the joys I have as a pastor of this church in particular is I hear story after story of how you are giving yourselves and discipleship to one another. Uh, we, we, I read this, this person is meeting with that person over here and encouraging this person with a word and, and serving this person over there. Uh, this, this congregation is, has been such a gift uh, to me to witness the, the investment of people into others. You know, one of the privileges our church uniquely has is to be able to, to disciple future pastors and, and missionaries. Uh, we bring a resident in for a season. We have the opportunity to invest in them so they can be more effective gospel uh, ministers in the future. You know, today is, is the one-year anniversary of Pioneer Church, church's first public service. Um, how many of the saints at Pioneer were invested in and encouraged in Christ at Park Baptist Church. Uh, Trell Ross is a better pastor for his investment, being invested in it at his time here at Park Baptist Church. Uh, AP, uh, Elizabeth, Terrell, Nye, and Gerald were all poured into while they were here, and now they're being a blessing to that congregation. I uh, Just think about how, many, how much God has done in Thomas Broom's life in the time he's been here as, as a resident. What, would God, what will God do in Alan and, and Michael and Josue and Samuel's life during the year that they are with us? I, I say that to you is because when, when we bring in residents, it is the church's job to say we are going to invest in them. I say the greatest thing that Park Baptist Church has is not its elders, but is the people of God at Park Baptist Church. It's the investment that the people of God make in one another. Discipleship is a community project. All of us have responsibility to invest in one another for the glory of God. So, who are you encouraging? How are you individually encouraging people? I'm so encouraged as a pastor of this church how you're investing your lives into one another. I could just say this, do so more and more. I would love every single member to be able to say this is who I am encouraging in Christ. This is how I am encouraging this person in Christ. That should just be a regular conversation that we have among ourselves. We want to help people follow Jesus Christ. Let us be a community of encouragement. 
Number two, our, our second question, are you praying for the Spirit to exercise power? Are you praying for the Spirit to exercise power? Each and every Lord's Day, we gather to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. When we gather, are, are you praying as you come into these, this sanctuary, gathered as God's people, to, that the Holy Spirit would come in power? We will not see transformation. We will not see conversion in our own effort. We need the Spirit of God. Acts 27 is the first time where we clearly see the, the, the pattern of worship in the New Testament. It says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. Uh, the Jews would worship the Lord on Sabbath, which was, uh, which was Saturday. Uh, it was marked as a time where everyone would rest from their labors and give worship to, to God. And that was really a marker of how you defined that their worship of Yahweh was we didn't do anything on Saturday. We gave that all to the, to the Lord. The New Testament pattern of worship follows the resurrection, setting aside the first day of the week to rest in the finished work of Christ upon his raising from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplished our salvation. We rest from our works when we trust in the finished work of Christ, the work on the cross and his resurrection. We rest from our work because we cannot earn our salvation. We've already heard it in the songs that we've sung today. So the New Testament pattern is to set aside the first day of the week the Lord's Day, as we learn in Revelation 1.10, to break bread and to hear the word of the Lord. The church gathered, broke bread, commemorating the Lord's Supper, and then they heard the word of the Lord. So we do the same thing week after week after week. We set aside the Lord's Day to assemble, to gather as God's people, to break bread, to sing psalms and hymns and, and spiritual songs, and to sit under the word of the Lord. You know, each and every week, you're not going to have an amazing experience. I don't want anyone to fall asleep. That would be awkward in this, today's sermon, okay? Every Sunday, we do what saints have done throughout centuries. We come, we hear the word, we sing of the gospel, we pray to our king week after week after week. What, what makes our gathering special is not you or I. What makes our gathering special is the Lord who ordained it. And we come together every single week to experience that together. And when we are gathering, we are displaying our faith declaring that what we are seeing now as the saints gathered in faith for under the lordship of the Lord of Christ, the one day that will happen on the day of the Lord. This is the Lord's day and one day on the day of the Lord when the word of God will go forth, he will assemble all his people to himself and we will be with him forever, worshiping him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, I know that we have many visiting today, visiting family. I would encourage you, if you do not have a church family, find one. Find one that commit, is committed to the Bible, that preaches the gospel, and invest your life there. We notice in this passage how central the Word of God is in the gathering of the saints and the power of the resurrection. But first, we can chuckle on how long sermons can kill you. <laughs> Literally. Verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Full stop. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, taking him in his arms, said, be, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. So the night was dragging on. Uh, there was a lot of lamps burning in, 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 the, in the room. The lamps would suck the oxygen out of the air. 
So you would have a window or a wind door, right, to, to cause the wind to have air flow through the room. And Eutychus, being wise, went to sit by the window to get some fresh air, sank into a deep sleep, and fell out. It was a third-story building, and he was taken up dead. Uh, Paul went to him, bent over him, and raised him from the dead. Beloved, Eutychus was dead. Or as I like to say, he was dead dead, right? He had no life in him until God raised him from the dead. So Elijah, the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul, all have demonstrated by the Spirit's power of raising someone from the dead. Every one of those stories authenticates the message of the gospel and the hope offered to the Messiah, the hope of the Messiah that was to come in Elijah, the hope offered, uh, the hope of the Messiah who came in Christ, and the hope of the Messiah that will come again in the Apostle Paul. The power of God descended on Eutychus. He was dead, and God gave him life. Friend, if you're here and you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible calls you dead. It calls you spiritually dead, dead in your trespasses and your sins. You may be breathing. You may feel that there's life in you, but spiritually, if you do not have Christ, you are, biblically speaking, dead. You need a resurrection. God needs to take your stony heart and gives you a, a new heart. You must be born again. We need a resurrection. This is exactly why God sent Jesus Christ, to be our resurrection. He came to die for us. The only way that you and I can experience a true resurrection is if somebody else takes our death and gives us that resurrection. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. So if you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what he did. He came and he lived a perfect life. He never sinned, did no wrong. So when he died, he died in your place to pay your debt that you owe because of your sins. And he didn't just pay your debt, he, he went to the tomb. He took your death in the grave. He paid for it completely, and then God raised him from the dead. God says if you repent of your sins and you trust in him, he will give you his perfect life. He will give you the record of his perfect life and his resurrection. Every resurrection we see in the Bible is given so we would understand our own need for our own resurrection. And it would point us to the one who gives us that resurrection in Christ. So friend, if you are not a follower of Christ, please turn from your sins. Trust in Christ. You will be saved, and I promise you, you will experience a spiritual resurrection now and a bodily one in the day of the Lord. Repent. Turn to Christ and live. Those of you who are followers of Christ, does the Word of God excite you or does it bore you? We know throughout the history of the church there have been many preachers, myself included, right, who have caused people to fall asleep because of their sermons, okay? But there's been many other people who have gathered who have fallen asleep because they have been uninterested in the Word of God. They come here not thinking about what God has to speak to me, but they're more concerned with other things. They're more concerned what's happening on their social media feed or their, their grocery list than listening to the Word of the Lord. Do you come each and every day with an eager anticipation of what the Lord is going to say, how the Lord is going to speak, how the Lord is going to exercise His power in the gathering of the saints? Do you expect God to speak? Do you pray eagerly and earnestly that the Spirit would save someone who is far from God? That eternal life would happen every Sunday? Do you be sanctify and unify the church? Do you pray for the Spirit to exercise His power? Or do you gather each week spiritually asleep, coming going through the motions, physically here, but a spiritually asleep. Wake up. Wake up. 
There are many factors, beloved, why we may lose focus on a given Sunday. We could have had a a long night the week before, a a restless sleep. All you new parents, you'll know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, we, We may have had a long week, but those days should be few and far between. We should come week after week with an eager anticipation for what God will speak through His Word by His servant for the glory of His name. God will speak. Are you listening? How we approach every Sunday morning is, is an indicator of our trust in God's sovereign word. The Bible says his word will never return void. It will always accomplish his purpose. Are you listening? I mean, think about this story of even Paul's investment. He spent all night teaching the word of God. He spoke until midnight. God brought a resurrection through his power. And then Paul continued to spend time with the saints until daybreak. It says that he conversed with the saints. He didn't just talk at them, he talked with them. And the saints were were comforted in what they saw and heard. Think of the energy it took for Paul to share not only the word, but his time with these people. Now, I am kind of a unique individual than many of you. I'm 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 an extrovert. I'm not sure if you knew that about myself, but I like people. I like being around people. Now, there's some of you who are not extroverts. You're kind of on the other side of being an introvert. Okay, we all know who you are, right? Can, can, you, can you imagine uh, as an introvert or even as an extrovert being with people all day and then all night, investing them, talking about deep spiritual matters? This was a huge investment of Paul's time and his energy. And what did he do? He just did it. He invested his life in these saints. You know, one of the reasons Paul experienced so many blessings and witnessed so many miracles is because he was willing to regularly gather with the saints in the power of the Spirit by his word. You know, there are some services in our gatherings. You know, those of you who don't know, we gather Sunday morning, uh, Sunday night, and and Wednesday night every week, second Sunday, second and fourth Sunday. Do you guys want to go back to every Sunday? We'll talk about that later. Um, (laughs) You know, there's some weeks where we, we have a gathering, and I say to myself, I am so glad I didn't miss that. Even this past Wednesday night, uh, at the end of our, our prayer time, we just had this five to seven minute time where we were just praying for people in our life that we wanted to see converted. It was a sweet time of just resting in God's power, saying, I believe that God has the power to save. God, save my husband, save my father, save my brother and my sister, save my children. You almost could feel the power of the Holy Spirit in the room that moment and the sweet communion of the saints. And I think, as Luke writes, there was not little comfort. Let me encourage you to be, continue to be faithful to the gathering of the saints, praying for the Spirit to exercise His power to save and to sanctify His people. The last question, do you have exclusive priorities? Do you have exclusive priorities? You know, when you look at this passage, I was reading this passage earlier with the, the, the residents th- this week, and it doesn't really seem to be one clear theme from verse 1 through verse 16. There's maybe little themes. Maybe one big one is what I tried to, 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 to show you, this investment. Paul invested his life in people. He invested his life in teaching, and now he's investing his life in following the will of the Lord. And Paul had an exclusive priority to serve and honor the Lord. Uh, He did not do all that he wanted. He did what the Spirit constrained him to do. Look at verses 13 through 16. It says, Paul, sorry, but going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asos, attending to take Paul aboard there, for he had arranged attending himself to go by land. And when he met at Asos, he took him on a board, we took him on a board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chiros, the Next day we touched at Samos, and the day after we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia. For he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So again, Luke lays out this travel uh, narrative, these places that Paul and his companions visited. But I just want to point out how exclusive Paul's priority was to do the Lord's will. Uh, Paul felt constrained by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. We'll see that in in the very next section. Uh, He had to make a choice based on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, we all have to make choices 
in life. We all have to make choices on what we are going to prioritize in this life. There will be things that demand our time and our attention. It may be our jobs, it may be kids' activities, it may be family obligation. There are some things we can't avoid, and some things would be sinful if we did avoid. But we should always prioritize what the Lord wants us to do. We know the Lord wants us to spend time in His Word. We know that the Lord wants us to gather with His saints. We know the Lord wants us to pray. We know the Lord wants us to invest our lives into others. We know the Lord wants us to take the, the precious gospel and share it with those who are far from God. Paul was a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's what I read earlier. He charged Timothy, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So let me just ask you, are you today entangled with civilian pursuits? Are you caught up in the world with your priorities? Are you unable to serve the saints or to reach the lost because your priorities are misaligned? Does God have exclusive rights over your priorities? Do you prayerfully submit your schedule to Christ first or commit your schedule then ask God to bless it? Listen, it is hard. It is very hard to question someone's priorities. It is hard to, to question how someone spends their time and their money. But I believe if we, the elders of Park Baptist Church, are going to be faithful, we have to do that. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for this would be of no advantage to you. As elders, we've been charged to care, to watch out for your souls, watch over your souls. Uh, we have to watch and see if the, your souls are in a good place with the Lord. You know, we, we are not the Holy Spirit. We can't see everything. We, don't, we can't discern the, the, the intentions and the motives of the heart. That's the Lord. But we can see the fruit. We can see how you're spending your time and how you're spending your, your, um, your resources. We can, we, can, we can ask ourselves, are we entangled with civilian pursuits? Are our priorities right? Almost every week, before I preach, I pray that the word of God that is sown would fall on fertile soil. You know, I want the good soil of Mark 4.20 for every person, which says, but those that were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. I know that unless God's power attends the preaching of the word, I have nothing to offer. The word of God has to fall on fertile soil. That means you have to hear it, accept it, and bear fruit. That's the goal of every sermon, that you would hear the word, that you would accept it, and that you would bear fruit. The sowing of God's word requires spiritual power. And yet my fear, week after week, is that many of you, the word does not fall on the good soil, but among the thorns. Mark 4, 18 and 19. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in, choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Hear that again. And others are the ones sown among the thorns, those who hear the word. That's us. Every single one here, if you're not asleep, wake up, right? You hear the word. You're hearing the word right now. Maybe the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. As I think about our own congregation, I think the two that cause me the greatest fear that we may be the most danger of, of are the cares of this world and the desires of other things that enter in. They choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Listen, we cannot avoid the cares of this world entirely. We cannot avoid the desires for other things entirely. We are 
but we are commanded by Christ to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We can control how we respond to those things that come upon us. When we feel the cares of this world creeping in, when we feel like the desire for other things, we can say, no, we seek first Christ and his kingdom. I would encourage you, especially as you answer, uh, enter into a new semester, to analyze your priorities. Do your activities, your travel, your hobbies, your interests push you towards Christ? Push you towards his people? Or do they pull you away from them? Are you so busy that you miss the time with the saints? Now listen, I do not want to create a legalistic culture in our church. But I want every single one of us to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No good soldier gets enter- entangled with civilian or worldly pursuits since his aim is on the one who enlisted him. Are you entangled? Do you desire for other things? Are the cares of this world overtaking you? As the one who has been charged to shepherd your soul, let me encourage you to have exclusive priorities for the Lord. It's his will first. The Apostle Paul did many things But when the Lord gave him directions, he obeyed, regardless of the cost. He knew that going to Jerusalem would would cost him his life. But the Lord said, go, so he went. So, beloved, if one of our elders sends you a text or calls you and says, we are concerned for you and your priorities, do not get angry. It is said in love. God has given you shepherds because you need them. God has given me shepherds because I need them. Shepherds are sheep too. Part of our church covenant states that we promise to one another every time we gather uh, in our members' gatherings that we will walk together in brotherly love as become the members of a Christian church, exercise an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, and faithfully admonish and entreat one another as occasion may require. We will seek by divine aid to live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, remembering that as we've been voluntarily buried by baptism and raised again from the symbolic grave, so there is now on us a special obligation to lead a new and holy life. Listen, the world and the devil does not want you to be fruitful. God has given us each other so that we can help tend the soil of each other's hearts so that we would bear much fruit. So when the word of God is sown on a Sunday morning, we would hear it, we would receive it, and we would bear much fruit. I pray that we would all have a Paul in our life, beloved. I pray we will all have a Timothy in our life. I have Coach Pick, and Pick has me. We have each other, and God has given us each other so that we would live as Jesus Christ is our greatest treasure. The world hates Jesus. The world hates when we encourage others to follow Jesus. The world hates when we make Jesus Christ our main priority. The world hates when we make the church a priority because the church is when we come together in the name of Christ submitting to his will. The world is going after our minutes, our hours, our days so we would take our eyes off of Christ. But our lives should be marked by his glory, beloved. The Lord Jesus had a singular priority for God's glory. He, his glory led him to the cross. It led him to the tomb. It led him to the resurrection, the ascension, and to the right hand of God the Father. Our lives should be marked by a joyful desire to encourage all people to experience the joy of Jesus Christ as their greatest treasure. Is Jesus your greatest treasure? then encourage others to have those kind of priorities. Invest your life to encourage others to know Jesus and to make him known. If you do that, you will live a life well lived and you will make a worthy investment into the kingdom of God. Father, I pray as we have looked at Paul's life that we would be encouraged to be more encouragers of others, uh, that we would understand that you and you alone should be our main priority. And we pray, God, that we would desperately seek you day after day, week after week, to exercise your power to bring salvation among us, um, 
and to continue to uh, work your salvation in and through us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I read earlier